Hello everyone, my name is Gracian and welcome to a Let's Play and tutorial series on Songs of Conquest, a fantastic strategy game by Lava Potion, the developers, and it's published by Coffee Stain, who has a real lot of great games under their, under their hood, like um, Deep Rock Galactic, which is one of my ultimate favorite games of all time. Now I should mention that this first episode is going to be an episode zero in which I probably don't get any actual gameplay done. This is an episode where we're going to take a look at all the systems, explain the resources and the city building, and take a look at some of the factions and their units. So if you do want to just see gameplay, you're going to want to skip to episode one. So Songs of Conquest is a strategy game that is sort of a spiritual successor to the Heroes of Might and Magic series, specifically Heroes of Might and Magic 3, which is really, I'd say the overwhelming majority of players consider that to be the best or one of the best Heroes of Might and Magic games ever made. If you're not familiar with the Heroes of Might and Magic series, this is a strategy game where you have a city, you produce troops from it, and then you have heroes running around on the map collecting resources and toting those troops around, and then you enter battles with different stacks of units, either the other player units or the neutral units that are guarding resources on the map. And then you go into a tactical battle with, um, in this case, is a hex grid. And you move your units around, they have different powers, different ranges, armor, and attack scores, and all sorts of different stuff. Plus, your commanders can cast spells in combat, which is extremely cool. So let's take a look at some of the factions and stuff before we go any further. So let's see here. So the factions are Arleon, which is sort of like humans plus sort of like fae. Like they have these, um, they have all of these sort of like pixies and like those kind of characters. Like they sort of look like they have like satyrs and dryads and that sort of stuff in their, in their retinue. The Barony of Loth is my favorite. These are the undead. So they have a bunch of um, cultists. They have necromancers. They have sort of um, dark casters and, and animators. Baria, these are sort of your, your greenskins, your goblins. They have a lot of um, those sort of sorts of units. And then Rana is sort of like your lizard folk or your, um, they also have like amphibians and stuff in there too, but they're, they're, I guess you could think of it as sort of like a swamp faction. So they have a lot of different like sort of scaly sort of creatures in through here like this. So if we take a look at their units, if you're familiar with Heroes of Might and Magic, this will be extremely familiar to you. So Arleon, for instance, has militia, and these are just like low level peasants and beggars that can fire crossbows and then they do like a little bit of damage these particular units have a range attack um, they cost a certain amount of gold and then they have to reload but you can upgrade the building at some point during the during the run if you wish to um upgrade them into sappers so now that they're a little bit stronger and so they have things like rangers minstrels and troubadours footmen and they have all the way up to like these, um, here we go, horned ones. These are like interesting, like satyr type creatures. And then they have these like fey, like these flyer guys that are fast skirmishers. And then they have these incredibly big, powerful, like druid type creatures here that are sort of their ultimate unit. The barony has things like these basic zombies you get for free from things. We've got plague rats, we've got skeletons, cultists, sort of poison shooter guys. The Baria, they have um, pipers, so these are like little, <laughs> these are little um, little soldiers that uh, produce music for the rest of the the troop. And then they have pikeneers, musketeers, and they have like these um, hyena creatures, these big brute creatures. Um, the Rana down here, so they have these like spear wielding frogs, some shaman lizards, some of these big like tough frog guys. They have these bird creatures, this terrifying worm thing, and they even get these like um, dragon guys that can have actually three tiers to them, which I'm not sure why. I don't actually play this faction in particular very much. So let's get into it. So let's go ahead into single player and let's just uh, do a, a skirmish here. So we're going to pick our map here, select map. You can't sort this for some reason by size or name or number of players or anything, so that's kind of unfortunate. Um, but you can see the size and the number of players here. So I'm just going to look for a two player one. I think there are two player. Yeah, there's randomly generated maps. So let's do that just so we don't have any idea what we're going to come across. It looks like what they're going to do here is basically have 
So it's sort of like a node system. So essentially there'll be a, a, an area for one of the players, an area for another player, and then somewhere between them will be a, probably a resource rich area and then another area that provides uh, building capabilities so that you can build like a forward base or even capture a full like citadel and, and produce units and stuff out of there. We'll get into that when we see it in the game. But this two player map looks like this is the base of how they're going to be generating that map. You can see if you go up to like eight players, it can get quite complicated. You can even do really cool like, you know, 2v2v2v2s or something like that or 4v4s if you wanted to. That looks like it would be a really intense and long battle here on a very, very big map. So let's do two player random. And then I'm going to play as, uh, I think I'll do Barony of Loth because that's my favorite. And then I will do a random starting leader. And I like to go with uh, purple as my second favorite color. And then for the AI here, let's do a random faction. So we'll have no idea what they're going to be. Let's make them a c much more clear color to see the difference between us. I'm colorblind, so I usually have to do that. So random faction, random hero to start. We can t take a look at our map settings, so we can do things like alter the resources if we want. Neutral dwelling troop production. So are there neutral dwellings? How fast do they make troops to defend themselves? How many wielders? These are your heroes. You can have like a low number of wielders if you want. So if you want to have sort of all your forces concentrated into a couple of places. Or you could have like wielders running around all over the place with all sorts of different amounts of troops. Just gobbling up resources and skirmishing. That could be interesting. Hostile initial size. So this would be like the neutral units on the on the map. Like how strong are they in, in, in terms of their numbers? So let's say that there would normally be 20 of the little p militia characters in one spot. Maybe they'd be like 25 or something if you turn this up. Hostile growth rate. We can see, you know, how fast do the um, hostiles grow in strength. Here's a random seed in case you ever wanted to do the exact map you're going to see me on. And then there are also some random events that will affect things like they could be good or bad. You might, you know, have some sort of find some resources or perhaps like something bad happens to your army or something like that. We'll just leave it on just for the flavor of it. All right, so now that we have our game all set up, let's start game. All right, so we have started with with this gentleman here, Baron Aldous of Loth. So this is some sort of Baron. Now you can see here he has uh, ratings in offense, defense. He's got a level, which is one, zero experience, and 12 movement. And when he's selected, we can see his movement sort of across the the map like how far he could go and all around here you can see we have different resources so we have ancient amber we have a pile of stone we have piles of gold so we have all these different sorts of shinies we can go and pick up um, and then up here we can see where those resources are stored so here's our gold we have 3000 we get 500 per turn and it shows that's from towns and settlements so it's going to be our capital here which we'll take a look at we have zero stone and no income, or it would show like a plus. Zero wood and no income. Zero glimmer weave. Zero ancient amber and zero celestial ore. So these are the common resources, gold, stone, and wood. And then these are a little bit less common. Um, I would say these two are pretty rare. And a lot of the upgrade materials you need for specialized like buildings and late game units and stuff will require some of these more um, hard to get resources. So what we want to do is if we can secure a source, an, an, a, um, a permanent income of one of these two types, that will help determine what kind of troops we want to buy. Because like, say we want upgraded, you know, some kind of undead unit that costs amber, but we only have access to celestial or we got to find a way to use that or we can even build like a marketplace and sort of buy the amber as we go so that's all the resources up here over here so again we were looking at our commander here we have one wielder so we have one of one hero and this we can get more heroes as i think it's as we uh, upgrade our our building here so we have his movement points he still has 12 movement left we can take a look at his character sheet 
we can take a look at his spells or our spells and then we have his a quick rundown of his units you can see he has three slots for units up in here he has seven oath bound which are sort of skeletons seven cultists and you can see their stack size is currently seven but it can go up to 40. so if we had say 41 skeletons we could have a stack of 40 and then a stack of one here you can't have them in any bigger piles than that we also show here his level, his experience, and then we have here his essence. Now, essence is like spellcasting mana in a way, but there's all these different types. So we have here order essence, chaos, destruction, creation, and arcana. So depending on what kinds of units you have and what kind of leader you have for those units, you will generate different kinds of these magics during battles, and then you can use those on different spells. We'll talk about that probably more in the combat episode, but we might get into one in this, this episode just so we can show that off. And here we have our mini map. You can see we're in the bottom left corner here. So I'm guessing the enemy player is in the top right. We have one settlement here, uh, Crow's Watch, the excavation, which is what this archetype of city is called. This is an excavation. And it has two available small build sites. So if you've played Heroes of Might and Magic, say let's say three, just, just to make it easy. Three is the one I played the most. When you go into your structures, that's where you would build, like inside your city. You don't do that in this game. They do something a little bit different. You Instead of having one of each building that you can produce, you instead have these building slots. So right here, I have a small building slot. So I can build any of these small buildings if I have the, the materials for them. And then if I were to go to the other site, I can build any of them, including the same one. So let's say I'm finding tons and tons of, let's see, here's the croft to get gold. Here's the crypt to get oathbound. So let's say I'm finding tons and tons of a resource that makes me think I'm going to want to buy lots of these skeletons. I could build a crypt here and here and have double the oathbound growth. Basically, I have more and more of these every turn to use. Or it could diversify. I could get rats in this spot and a crypt here to get skeletons. There are non-unit um, buildings. So here's a croft. You can get this to make money per turn if you're finding your income is lacking. You can get a stoneworks to get stone per round, a timber mill to get lumber per round, a guard tower, which will make the, the garrison of the city more powerful if someone came to attack you. And then you also have a rally point, which will let you, yes, I have seen this before. Thank you. Rally point will let you purchase troops. You go Instead of going to the city and buying stuff, if I had a rally point in a city, say in the middle of the map, I could use the rally point to summon the units from this town which was a really really cool uh feature that they have in this game i don't know if you remember in heroes of might and magic 3 you know if you if you wanted to restock your troops you had to run all the way back to your city get them and then bring them back or have a series of heroes sort of like fire brigading like passing the bucket off to each other all the way to your front line but now at least you can sort of set up a rally point if you have a building site available somewhere else which is really nice so let's take a look at the unit card of our wielder here. So you can see he's got offense. Let's hover over this. As wielder's offense is passed on and added to its troops, melee offense, and raged offense. So the higher this number, the more damage our troops are going to do in combat. Defense is the same, but passed on to the troops. So the higher defense here, the less damage our troops will take from enemies. So you can see he gives more defense than offense. So he's sort of a more of a commander or a, sort of a, like a tactician type character. Um, he has this movement is for him and the view radius is also for him. So the view radius is how far out he can see. I am not sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we must have higher view range from our city because he shouldn't be able to see quite as far as he can. So if we go back into his sheet here, you see he has specialization. So he gets plus one order essence. So that changes like what kind of magic we have uh, available in combat to cast spells. He has total troop modifiers. He's adding 10% damage, five melee offense, five ranged offense and plus 10 defense so you can see that's coming from here offense of five is adding five to melee and range defense of 10 is adding 10 to everybody and then he also has some skills here so he has command unlocks the ability to bring three troops with you in your army so he has command level three so he can have three slots 
and he has combat training one your troops gain plus 10 percent damage so that's where this modifier is coming from here so he doesn't add very much damage from his own offense but he does have a skill that adds it so he's he's kind of a very sort of standard like if you wanted to play this faction but were unfamiliar with like how to do the zombie rezzing and that kind of stuff then you could just play this guy he's very just sort of basic attack and defense that's it you also have equipment and inventory so you'll pick up like magic items of different quality as you play the game um, there'll be different places on the map like if we scroll in I can't tell if that's one there but you can find magic items in some of these locations sometimes they're sitting on the map sometimes there'll be rewards from things uh, and then you can equip them to the hero and they might do something like add a movement point or plus five offense and then that would translate to your troops as well so most of the equipment you're going to get is going to be things that just translate to making your troops better or at least giving them more support on the battlefield. You can also gain more skills as you level up and eventually you can get these like powerful abilities down here. You, I think you can only have two of them. I think you get them every like five or ten levels. can't remember exactly when you get those. So let's go ahead and talk about the magic really quickly. The magic system in this game, instead of having like a mana pool that your hero has and has to like wait for it to recharge or go and fill it up somewhere, you generate the magic over time during a fight based on the troops you have. So if I click on the spells menu here, you can see here, here's the order spells, the chaos spells, the destruction spells, the creation spells, and the arcana spells. And then over here are sort of the combined things. So if we go down this here, you can see there's a plus three. If we hover over it, it says plus two order essence from troops, plus one order essence from wielder specialization. So every turn in combat or round, I should say, we're gonna get plus three order essence. And so we'll have like little numbers uh, of magic points in combat that will sort of add up over time. So we'll be getting three blue, none of the chaos, one destruction, none of the creation, and one of the arcana. So what that means is, you see how this here has a little cost of four, five, eight, and 12. So in two turns, we would have six order and we can cast protection one. Target friendly troop gets plus 10 defense and plus 10 spell damage resistance. Uh, for one troop round. So for a little bit of this magic, you can give somebody some protection, or you can let it save up and get something really big, like say here, Rally 1. All friendly troops get 10 defense, 10 offense, 10 spell damage resistance until the end of the round. So that's like a full round, so every troop will get it for one, one turn, essentially. So if we go look at our troops here, if we hover over the Oathbound, the Skeletons, if you see down at towards the bottom of the list, it says Essences, Order, and Destruction. So that means these soldiers are providing Order and Destruction mana every turn in combat or every round. The Cultists are providing Order and Arcana. So you can see here we have one Order, one Destruction, one more Order, one Arcana. So we've got two Order, one Destruction, one Arcana, and then our, our commander here has plus one order. So that's where we're getting three order and then the one destruction and the one arcana. So that's how that works. So if you have multiple stacks of the same unit, I believe they add more of that mana in. You just have weaker stacks of units now because the entire stack hits and then gets hit back. We'll talk about that in the next episode when we do some combat. And then depending on like, say if you upgrade the cultists, they may provide a different type of essence and you can even bring other types of troops. So let's take a look here at our, here we go. So rats, rats provide one destruction, oathbound provide order and destruction. And then we can't build any other units from the small sites, but you can see we can take a look at the other sites we can build. So here's the laboratory. The toxicologists will make arcana and destruction. Here we have the cultists, they upgrade into Aurelian scholars that no longer provide order, but instead provide two arcana and one destruction. So that's interesting, it actually changes what it does. The mausoleum can produce specters. Here we have the Aurelian sanctum, which will let us produce cultists or Aurelian scholars. Now this is not the upgrade of this unit here. So this one produces 
order in Arcana, this one produces two Arcana and one Destruction. These ones are interesting because they're they're really there to provide you with tons and tons of mana for using spell casting. They're not very strong as an actual attack unit. You can see they're also helpless. They can't even retaliate if they do get hit. So you have to be a little careful with these guys, but they can provide you with tons of mana. So you can cast tons of spells. Uh, we have the Mausoleum. This will let us build Spectres, which provide Arcana, or Scavenged Bones, which provide Destruction. And then we also have a trading post here. It's like a marketplace where you can sort of uh, sell goods and buy goods. And then we have the large building slots, which we don't have access to yet. We have the Summoning Circle, which lets us build the Legion, which is Order and Destruction. And then these are like upgrade buildings here. We'll talk about those once we get access to them. So for me, usually the first order of business would be to get this building upgraded because it makes you have more gold and gives you more building sites. So you can see in order to upgrade it, you can hover over it here. We need 2000 gold, which we have, but we don't have any wood or any stone. So if we can get five of each of those, we can upgrade. So we might say head over to this stone, maybe grab this pile of wood as well. Um, let's see here. We've got abandoned cart, old urn. Those are sources of riches. There are also packs of enemies that are guarding things. So for instance, here you can see if I wanted to go get this ancient amber or this wooden idol here, this, this unit's projecting sort of an aura around it that's defending this from me getting to it. Same here with this pile. So you can see I can hover over it. This says a group of Arlian troops. So these are neutral troops. There's a few fists of order, one to five, which are like their cavalry. And they're they're not really weak. It's just that there's only one to five of them. So it says threat level towards Aldus is easy. So I could go take this on right now and I should win that. No problem. Could I probably lose some troops. This game, you will lose troops. This isn't like, say, Age of Wonders or Planetfall, um, where, where the goal is to try not to lose your troops unless you really must. You're going to have stacks of units. You might be bringing hundreds of troops into a fight. Like, you're going to lose stuff. It's just going to happen. Here's another one, a threat level worthy. So it's got several wolves and several brigands. I don't want to do this because I could lose too many troops or all of them even. So that's that's too risky for right now. I'll wait till we have more forces. This one we could do, but I don't really need this amber yet. So we're not going to do that one. So what I'm probably going to do is try to go get this uh, pile of wood here. We picked up only two. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. And then I might head over to the stone. Looks like I can still reach it this turn. You just right click to send units for stone. So what I might do here is build a timber mill for 1200. And then um, we can't build another building quite yet, but we'll probably go with the stoneworks. Once that's done next turn, we'll start producing wood every turn. Uh, and then we'll probably get the stone one as well. And then in the late game, if I don't need those anymore, I can sell them or I can use the materials they make to sell in the marketplace. And then there's a little pile of gold right here. Let's just grab that. And now I've used up all of my movement. So the early turns in this game, sort of a one of the downsides is that they're going to be kind of boring. You have to kind of go around and collect all this stuff. And you can see you kind of run out of like movement pretty quickly. And you only have the one unit to, to do stuff. So you kind of feel like you're kind of wasting your time a little bit at the beginning, but eventually you'll have multiple wielders uh, running around doing things. They usually have like one for collecting and one for fighting. Uh, and then later game, you might want to have two different armies, one to go off and conquer small groups so you can pick up the resources and one to sort of head over towards what your enemy is doing and try to uh, harass them or, or take their stuff. And so we can see here down in the bottom, it looks like we are fighting Arlion based on this flag here. That's the, the Fey and the humans sort of combined. So it looks like it's a good old human versus undead sort of fight here. So uh, this should be a, an interesting fight. They, they have sort of the most straightforward units for the most part. It's just sort of like archers and swordsmen and knights and stuff. All right, everybody. So I'm going to call it here for this um, tutorial episode zero, where we really didn't do any sort of real gameplay other than move our character around a little bit. We'll come back in the next episode. We'll actually start playing and then we'll probably jump into a fight uh, and show off how that works and stuff like that. Because the tactical combat in this game is, is quite it's quite fun. You've got the you've got an initiative system. You've got different ranges that make your troops do more or less damage. There's buffs and debuffs. There's all sorts of spell casting and stuff like that. And just having like the variety of units is also really cool as you get access to more and more of those. So thank you everybody so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial episode on Songs of Conquest. Great, great game. They're still working on it. Um, 
they've added a lot of quality of life features in the past like few months and stuff i know a lot of people are always asking for another faction because right now there's four factions but adding a faction is is probably more work than absolutely anything else and they've been pretty open about that but hopefully we'll see some great things from them in the future i mean this random map that i'm on now this wasn't a feature when i first got the game there weren't random maps and now there finally are so really really cool so thank you everybody so much for watching and i'll see you in episode one we'll do some combat we'll do some exploration and we'll get things moving thanks again for watching